This video starts with the backdrop of the pinball machine because I want to show you just how much fog comes out the top of this little critter's head. This is a humidifier that just pushes into a drinks bottle as a water container and it runs off a USB power supply. And the actual power it's drawing is just minimal. It's like 170 milliamps. And look at the amount of vapour that it's actually atomising ultrasonically. So uh, let's take a closer look at that right now. So back at the normal bench, and although this is putting out the same amount of vapour, you can't really see it so well. I can see plumes going up towards the light. But uh, that's why I moved through to a different area, and that also uh, meant I didn't have to show you the absolutely horrendous state of my workbench, which is just the video zone, and then it's just clutter piled high around it. Some of which has been taken to parts, and you know, some of which has not been taken to bits yet, but is awaiting being taken to bits. But getting back to this, it's really impressive that this can atomise the liquid in that way with such a low power because normally these bigger, bigger units uh, draw quite a modest amount of current. And this is a, another generic Chinese atomizer. It's the ultrasonic disc, that, but it usually is the version that's submerged underwater. Uh, where's a pen? And uh, I just suddenly realised I'm running well out of ink in this pen, so uh, this might suddenly cut out in the middle of drawing. So normally, if you use this type of humidifier uh, or water atomizer. It's got the disc that actually fires, if that's the water level, it's got the disc that fires ultrasonic energy and it, it causes basically a little mini storm. It really sprays the water into the air, but it shatters the water apart on the surface and that's what creates the fog effect. Uh, and indeed quite a fountain, that's why you often see a little a cover over these things in the ornamental uh, displays to actually stop it spraying water everywhere. There's also a little uh, sensor, in this case it's a little metal stud, and other ones just have maybe an inductive sensor, and they're purely to detect uh, that the water is above the level of the disc, because if it's not, if the water level goes down too low and the disc is dry, then the disc will overheat, and that's the point that it can suffer damage, owing to the fact that if the disc gets too hot and it reaches its Curie temperature, then... But well, actually, I should explain that better. If you take the uh, cr uh, layer of the uh, piezoelectric material, which is a, a specific, it's a crystal optimised for uh, electrical characteristics, and if you raise it up to the temperature of uh, the Curie point that, and apply a voltage across it and let it cool down again, then it stores that charge. It's the, it's the point at which the molecule molecules magnetically sort of align, electrically align, and it remembers that charge and when you then apply, either when you press the crystal, it will generate voltage or if you um, apply a voltage to it, it will distort. And that's how these little horrible little high-pitched peepers work. The smoke alarms comes to mind, that's commonly uses them. And if they get too hot and they actually reach their Curie temperature, then they stop working because they basically everything just rearranges randomly and it loses that characteristic. Uh, I suppose ultimately you could take the discs out and you could heat them up and you could apply the charge again. Uh, but that probably requires quite controlled environment. And the Curie point is quite important to note. Uh, those of you who are into science will know Marie Curie. And the reason it's called the Curie point of the crystal is because of Pierre Curie. Hold on, let's see if I can spell his name wrong. Pierre Curie uh, and of course Marie Curie both brilliant scientists both married husband and wife and Pierre Curie he just was an absolute head in the clouds genius uh, he explored the, the behaviour of crystals and electricity. You know, that was his main pioneering thing. Uh, sadly, he met a rather horrible death when he was knocked down the street when he walked in front of a horse-drawn potato cart and it went over his head, which is really sad. And it's kind of ironic that his family said, yeah, you know, that's, he was never looking where he was going. He always had his head in the clouds, you know, and it's so sad that such a genius died that way just because he was doing what so many geniuses do and was just, you know, abstract just deep in thought. But, uh, we have Pierre Curie to thank for an awful lot of things like this. So here's the atomizer, and unfortunately to operate these things they require quite high power because they're operating through quite a large volume of water. This on the other hand doesn't, because uh, if I unplug this one now, because it is humidifying the place nicely, uh, I shall 
shake as much water off this so I don't get it over the bench and then I will get it on the bench because that's always what happens. Uh, if I pull this little stem off here, this one has a wick and it's, you know, it's the sort of wick you'd find in the aroma units. And indeed there was an aroma unit that used this very technique. Uh, it was battery operated and it just plucked a little piece of electric disc and it just put a wee cloud, I think it was called Wisp, and it put a cloud of the aroma into the, the air and it was unusual because it pr produced little bursts of really strong aroma. But the way these work is the disc it has an outer ring of the pizza electric material and then uh, there's a wee dimple in the middle and then tiny little holes around that dimple. And the effect is that uh, it sits down, that disc sits down on the wick and the wick just puts a very slight film of water against it. And it means that that doesn't have a big column of water to deal with. It The water, by virtue of the ultrasonic action, comes through these holes and then gets atomized off the surface and it means that very little energy is required to do it and that's how these work. This is how this can run on 5 volt power supply at 170 milliamps. So I'm guessing, and this is one of the reasons uh, I bought this, and apart from the fact someone actually suggested it and I'd been looking at these and I thought, well you know this looks a reasonable enough one. Um, I was looking at the listing and I thought, this contains electronics down here. Usually the electronics are up in the head, but uh, this has the electronics down in the base. And I can tell from looking at it that there's almost certainly, I mean, it could be wrong, there's probably going to be a little 8-pin chip, maybe, uh, a little on-off button here, uh, and a transformer probably under here, because the transformer is used to increase the voltage uh, up, because uh, ultimately with these things, it's... It, benefits from low current high voltage is the way piezoelectric tends to be driven for high output. So let's take the head apart for a start. Let's take the wick off. The wick is spring loaded, it's uh, just puts, uh, there's a spring in the bottom here and it just puts that little bit of pressure against the top just to hold it against the disc. How does this come out? Oh, I see. It's got little latches here. Lots of little latches that probably won't come out too easily. Oh, actually, I might be wrong. Here it comes. So, no active electronics in here at all. There's the cable. It's kind of like it's slightly butchered in here. It's just been, oh, right, okay, that's off now. Uh, here's the disc, mounted in a, a little silicon surround. I thought it would be quite, have to be mounted quite hard. And if I peel this off at the risk of damaging this, there's one electrode here, um, and then the metal side, the metal side that's got the little dimple in it for probably for rigidity, and it's got the little tiny microscopic holes in it. It's got a tab coming off one side, so there's one connection basically on either side of this ring of piezoelectric material here, and that's what does the uh, effect of the agitation of the basically pounding at ultrasonic frequencies down on top of this and atomizing the liquid off the surface. So let's take a look at the unit now. I'm looking at this, I can see little indentations underneath suggesting screws. Yep, screws. It's so sad that, uh, you know, Pierre Curie died in the way he did. It's just uh, just one of these things. You, you wonder what else he would have come up with because uh, he certainly seemed to be a prolific inventor. Now, a previous one, if you, you've seen the other video I put up ages ago called Smokin' Pink Ring, which was a little floating ring, had a little 8-pin microcontroller type thing. Oh, there's a little 8-pin microcontroller. There's a crystal. There's the button. There's the transistor that's driving the transformer and then the output with a little trans uh, choke to give it extra, an extra boost probably because the choke is in series of the output. Um, I would guess that ultimately the little microcontroller is probably not going to have a number on it as these things do. That's so common when they, they do that. I could be wrong. I'm not wrong. There is no number on it. It's mystery chip. 
But it's that Pika like, you know, it's the sort of thing that looks a bit like a Pic microcontroller, might not be. Oh, there's an LED as well. I didn't notice the LED before. Uh, the crystal is being used for an accurate timing reference for the chip so that it can actually control the. In software, it will be written to run that disk at a very precise frequency. Basically, it's resonant frequency that it's going to produce the best results at. Uh, that'll be also why they, they are using that little crystal because that makes it more stable, it makes it more predictable because the, often with these chips the internal oscillator isn't that accurate. Uh, fundamentally, you know, it's just a few support components around that little processor. And then, yep, smoothing capacitor, little button going straight to an input. Um, few support components, the crystal for timing, an LED, I didn't notice the LED, and let's, uh, at the risk of smoking that disc, let's, uh, yeah, it's got a wee blue, blue LED, I just heard the disc go zip. Hopefully I've not destroyed it in the process. Um, yeah, that's fundamentally it. It's the, the little transformer boosts the voltage up and then it goes even further to actually create quite sharp spikes with this little uh, little 330 microhenry choke in series. Um, so yes, interesting little thing. I like the fact the electronics are... I mean, obviously these will be optimised uh, in software for this disc, for the particular resonant frequency it operates at. But um, it's, it's super simple. It's functional. It's... Uh, it's very similar to the little uh, ping ring thing uh, atomizer version, and I'm guessing it's fairly common sucker to, to a lot of the others. But um, I have others to take apart as well, so I'll be taking them uh, to bits in the future. But in the meantime, this this is quite a neat implementation. It's surprising how much water it puts out from this wick. It's very impressive. Well, it would have been rude of me not to draw the schematic, so I've just uh, drawn the schematic. And the chip is pin for pin compatible with a PIC-12 microcontroller. I'm not saying it is a PIC-12 microcontroller. There are so many of those clony type chips that use the same pinout. But anyway, the power comes in from the USB port and it gets locally smoothed by capacitor, 100 microfarad, 10 volts, uh, smoothing decoupling. There's also a 1K resistor across the rails, probably to ensure that when it's unplugged, the voltage drops fast enough to ensure a good clean reset the processor. The power to the processor, positive goes to pin 1, negative goes to pin 8. Pin 4, which is normally the reset chip, uh, reset pin on many of these processors, is tied low. Pin 2 and 3 is the crystal, the little dinky crystal here, with its two um, capacitors to the negative rail. And the LED has its own resistor, um, and it's pulled low by pin 7 to light the LED when it's running the thing that's presumably got uh, internal pull-up because on pin 5 uh, they must have the uh, internal pull-up resistor enabled so the, the push button just pulling pin 5 to ground to actually for the input and here's where it gets a little bit odd the transistor was called an XOYV2L that's all, it had XOYV written across it and then 2L uh, written at right angles so I'm not 100% sure what that transistor is I'm guessing it's an NPN transistor. Certainly that's the sort of configuration it is. And there, it's unusual that the, it's being driven from pin 6 via a 100 nanofarad. I, I, I did test it in circuits, so I can't guarantee it's actually 100 nanofarad. But it's uh, being driven by a capacitor, and there's a 100k pull-down resistor on the base or the gate, whatever that transistor is. And it's quite unusual to see it driven by a capacitor. Um, but that's probably because the the it's actually driving quite a high current in the primary of this transformer, so it needs quite a high gate current. So they're probably cheating a little bit, and they're relying on the internal resistance of the output pin to limit the current in. And the reason the capacitor's there is so that if there's any little incidents, if the processor locks up or crashes in any way, uh, and the output remains high, the last thing you want to do is keep this transistor driven because it would make the transistor fail quite quickly because it would be seeing probably a dead short once the mag the magnetic field had been set up in the transformer. So by putting a capacitor there, it means that if the, the output does for unexpectedly turn on high for any reason, for any length of time, the trans 
the transistor will give one pulse to the transformer, and then uh, when that capacitor's charged, it won't no more current will flow until it's uh, the circuit's reset. The capacitor would look transparent to the ongoing, the positive and negative. Uh, output of that if it was actually running uh, continually with putting out the uh, square wave to drive the transformer. The output of the transformer just has a secondary winding and then a choke in series and then the transducer that actually atomizes the water. And that is fundamentally it. It's very simple. It's a very sort of textbooky type circuit. The only oddity is really being the 100 nano capacitor there um, and the lack of a base resistor. Um, yes, it's it's pretty much uh, it's pretty common to what you see in these units, uh, and this is a this is a nice implementation. It it puts out a surprising amount of fog for the current. It's it's quite impressive little unit.